Hello and welcome to Ask the Expert. Today's guest you know as one of the great American ballerinas. She was personally invited by Mikhail Barushnikov to join ABT and had a stellar career with the company. She's known all over the world and now she is the Dean of Dance at University of North Carolina School of the Arts. And our guest today is Susan Jaffe. Susan, hi. Hi. <laughs> One thing I, I uh, uh, wanted to say also, and I guess I'll say it now in uh, your introduction, is that you've been a friend and a judge, uh, a friend of YAGP and a judge at YAGP and a master teacher at YAGP from the very beginning. So this is the 20th uh, anniversary, not only of, uh, um, of Youth America Grand Prix, but also of, of, of your friendship with all of us in the organization. That's right. And, That's uh, right. And you've been one of the amazing uh, parts of, of its growth. So, so um, you're now uh, in charge of raising the next generation of, uh, of dance talent, of, of, of ballerinas, and uh, you're ushering the new, the future of dance uh, into the world. And uh, the one thing we thought we would talk about today is um, the art of acting, because one of the things you were so well known for is your roles, your passionate characters that you've built on stage. And uh, we thought it would be really great to share with our participants and with the world at large how the art of acting can change and enhance and enrich um, your life as a dancer and as a human being. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, well, first off, how has it helped you in your career? Oh, well, um, I got to the point in my career, I was about 10 years into uh, my career, and I started to feel um, that I had uh, accomplished the technical aspects, the stylistic aspects of the roles. And of course, you know, I was going as deep as I could into the roles, but I felt like there was something missing. And I ran into an old friend from years before and found out that he was working with several of the other principal dancers uh, on their roles. And so, and he was a theater director at the same time. So uh, when he told me that, I sort of grabbed him by the lapel and said, you have to work with me. And um, it opened up a whole world for me that I didn't have access to before. And to really go into the depth of the roles um, made my roles much more um, well-rounded and uh, and also I was able to make choices that were uniquely mine because when you're really uh, tackling a role from the inside out then the role actually starts to inform you um, it's almost like you're a conduit in a way for the role and it starts to inform you where it wants to go so it really changed my whole life as a dancer and, and my performance life. When you started employing that approach in your dancing, have people started to notice? Did, you, did people comment on it? Yes, uh, very much so. Uh, I also, at that time, started working with the great ballerina, uh, Irina Kolpakova. And I remember Many critics and uh, people were saying, you know, what happened to Susan Jaffe? There's a big transformation. And many of them attributed that to e my work with Irina, which absolutely um, gave me, um, working with her was one of the greatest gifts of my life. Um, but I also believe that um, the working with a dramaturg uh, and working from the inside out uh, contributed to to an expansion of my artistry. Well, what is a dramaturg for those who don't know? Okay, so apparently a dramaturg is different than in Europe than it is here, but right. here in the United States, a dramaturg is somebody who usually in a theater setting with actors uh, would sit next to the director and really see the overarching view of the entire work, as well as seeing all the detail of all the characters within the work and are the characters connecting it the right way and, and how to get uh, even more significance out of each of those characters, out of uh, uh, the intensity of each character and what they're trying to do, and really to just make sure that 
uh, the, the story is moving and and uh, growing in 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 a direction that gives depth and meaning to the play. So, in some ways, you could say that a, a dramaturg is a guardian of the story, is a person, is an artist who makes sure that the story works, that all the little gears connect and the story moves forward and there is nothing that falls out of the place, that, that the relationships are there, that the character development is there, so that the story that we see on stage actually makes sense, right? Absolutely. And I would say guardian, I'm not sure. I would say that the person that inspires the nourisher, the gardener of the story, to make sure the story grows into full bloom. <laughs> right, because I mean, I think, you know, a dramaturg isn't there to tell everybody what to do. Right. A dramaturg is there to pull out from each actor what is inside of them, right? So that it, it ends up being something far greater than what anybody could have imagined. Right. Uh, so my dramaturg worked with me Socratically which means he asked me a lot of questions. Right. You know, what are you feeling about this? What's your relationship to that? Uh, what were you doing before you came on stage or before you walked into this scene? Uh, how do you feel about that character? Um, what do you want? You know, all these questions. So that you, your wheels start to turn and uh, you start to organically develop the inner life of the character. This is very important what you're saying because I think one important distinction we must make right away is how do we define acting? Because mm -hmm. what you're saying, what you're talking about is real life. These are imagined circumstances, but, but you have to live for real on stage. And the moments that really touch us on stage are the moments of true life unfolding before us. Mm -hmm. So if you are to reproduce true life and to actually live on stage, you have to know exactly what these circumstances are. So you have to ask yourself those lo lots of questions in yes. a Socratic way. The more you're, you, you ask questions, the more the character uh, is, is right there with you. And uh, even when I was... In you? Inside, yeah. Even as I was doing um, the role of Lizzie Borden, who's an ex-murderess, right. you know, by the time I had studied and started rehearsing and was ready for the stage, I really felt exactly and knew exactly why this person had killed her parents, you know. So you, you're getting into the psyche of, of a character. And characters, you know, why are characters or why are, are ballets great? Because there are archetypal themes, there are symbolic themes, there are themes that make humanity who we are. And that's why they touch us so deeply. So that's why it's so important to be truthful uh, with who you are inside, living through this character. Right, because if it's not, if you're not truthful, it's immediately you can see it. You spot a fake, and and by fake I mean um, something. We say either something touches you or doesn't. So usually truth. And real life touches us. Real emotion touches us. You know, and if it's not real, if you're just portraying it, then it's, you know. That's true. It work. And, and also, um, sometimes I would watch dancers who I knew hadn't done the work, hadn't really done the work, because they would do what I call sort of pat, uh, pat characters. Sort of, this is what we're all expecting this character to do, and therefore they're doing it. You know. And if it's really real, um, it's it's unique, and as you said, it's moving through you. And so, you can't always know what your character, if you're really inside your character, what it is going, how he or she is going to react at that moment, right? So you are you are there with the re reactions and responses and uh, desires and all of those things. So that's how um, it, it builds depth and meaning uh, rather than already going on stage and knowing, well, this is who I am, and this is what I'm going to do, and that's my partner and all of those things. None of those really exist. I remember when I was about to go on stage and do Manon. 
and a very great ballerina was watching the performance in the audience and she came backstage to wish me good luck. And um, she said before I went on um, something about remember to be sexy or something like that. And you know, I was so inside the character that that made absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. Right. And I remember just kind of steaming up and my dresser took this ballerina and said, let's go, you know, and, you know, <laughs> just got her away from me because if you were, were coming into, into my sphere and telling me how I was supposed to behave in, in a character, that was sacrilegious to me. That was not where I was coming from. I was a conduit. I was ready. I was in that moment. And I had no preconceived ideas about what it was going to be. I just knew who Mendon was. So this is very important what you're saying, because what you're saying is that you have to do the preparation, you have to study the character, what happened to them before, what led them to being the way they are, what happened before the scene. You have to pump yourself up with all those circumstances. But once you do, you let go and you react in real life and in real moment to what's happening. That's so it's right. kind of like, so you don't know what's going to happen before it happens. Otherwise, it looks predictable and fake. Again, you know, there you fake go. meaning not real life like, because in real life, we don't know what happens the next moment. We never do. No, we Even never if we do. plan it out. Even if we plan it out. In fact, it never happens how we <laughs> plan. It's so. It's, it's so interesting because really, um, the study of theater has always captured my imagination and, and my heart and my soul because it really isn't an art about something else other than life. It's a study of life. Yeah. And so when we talk about theater and the art of acting, we're talking about the art of being truthful, real, and alive mm -hmm. in the moment. That's right. This is, this is so great. So um, uh, talk a little bit more about uh, how do you prepare a role, just in, in practical mm -hmm. terms. So, so you were lucky enough to work with a dramaturg um, who helped you do the work. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe some younger dancers or just dancers out there don't have that luxury. How can they be their own dramaturg? What are some of the steps they can make to prepare mm -hmm. for their role? Um, so first, uh, you either, if there is a book, a novel attached to whatever you are doing, like Romeo and Juliet, you would read the book, you would watch the play and watch the movie, you would um, study some of the characters of the movie actresses that did that role. And then you would study the era in which this character grew up and the customs of the time. And why, uh, for example, in Romeo and Juliet, why would it be such a uh, fatal flaw to fall in love with a quote-unquote enemy, and what did that mean at that time uh, in that era, and also how beholden you are to your parents. I mean, there it's life was so different than it is now. Um, so that's that helps to build your intensity and um, your um, the drive to try to to do what you passionately feel. So you would, you would do all that studying and then breaking it down scene by scene, you would also know who your uh, other people on stage are, who is Tybalt, who is your, your mother, who is your father. What relationship do you have with your mother that's different than your father? What relationship do you have with Tybalt and Paris and your friends and all of the characters and your nurse, right? So you would, according to whoever walks in the room or whoever you're interacting with, you have a different relationship with them. So um, you would definitely have to know who they are. It's not only all about you. It is who are you interacting with? So that way you're really developing a whole inner life, a whole world. Um, that feels real for you. And also, uh, so that would be pr to prepare for a role, but preparing for a role also happens in rehearsal. And there are a couple of tricks 
um, that I uh, used a lot, and also when I'm coaching uh, in a, a way of being a dramaturg, um, I would say don't anticipate. So if you're in rehearsal and you know that your mother is going to come in and you know you're going to run to her, oftentimes, especially younger dancers, make the mistake of knowing that that character is coming in and before you even recognize who they are or what's happening, you're already running towards them. So you're anticipating the scene instead of somebody comes in. Now, in real life, somebody would come in, you would hear them. Right? You would hear somebody come in. You might even recognize who they are, and you would react before turning. So that would be called, in acting, a pickup. You'd react and then turn instead of turn and go. So there are um, ways that you can stay present in the moment and make sure that you are not uh, ahead of yourself uh, in each individual scene. Because the character doesn't know who's going to walk into the room. Yeah, Somebody might come know. come in trying to kill you. Somebody come in uh, come in try to you know exactly. be a lover. I don't know whatever. Exactly. So y until you turn, you don't know who it is. So <clears throat> don't know who it is. Exactly. Before you actually find out exactly. on stage before our exactly. eyes. Exactly. <laughs> and entrances and exits are very important. Mm. Where were you before you walked in to this room? What do you want? What do you need? Why uh, do you walk in? You know. Yeah. Why are you there? What brings you into that space? So it's not, it's not um, good to be standing on the side, chat, 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 ha, 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 and then to go on stage because you're not inside the character, you know? And I used to get um, very cross with, uh, I danced with Manon a lot with Vladimir Malacha. Mm -hmm. I used to get cross with him before the third act when she's, you know, already dying, uh, coming off the boat, and he'd be in the wings laughing and joking, and, you know, I would just look at him like, just be quiet, you know, I'm, I'm about almost to die dead, here. yeah. So, um, but, you know, everybody has their own way of working, um, but I had to be inside my character before I walked on stage. So, in practical terms, your quote unquote performance or real life in these imagined circumstances starts off stage. Oh, yeah. So you can come in without interrupting. It doesn't start, the life doesn't start just when you get on stage. Exactly. It starts, you've been living and you happen That's to right. want something that causes you to come on stage. That's right. And exits. Yeah. Exits are also important. It's not like, oh, now I've done my thing and now it's time for me to leave and get off the stage. Right. You're going somewhere. Where are you going? What do you need? What do you want? Why are you going that way? You know, so it's, it's it also the intentionality of where you're going or why you're exiting is also important. And I can, you know, when I'm watching a performance and I know that they're not, they haven't uh, thought about their exits and entrances, I, you know, I can tell right there. Um, so every detail really counts. Even when you're sitting on the side, um, it's not, oh, I, the camera or the lights aren't on me, therefore I don't have to maintain my character. You are in your character wherever you are on that stage. Even if your back is turned to the audience, you are in character. You are not dancer A or dancer B. You are character. You are that person. Well, that, that's truly the difference between like just basically an athlete standing on stage and performing body movements versus a living person who is living and, and we're there to observe. That's the difference. Exactly. Because in that sense, we were just uh, uh, before talking about the eyes and how the eyes reflect, how the inner work, even if you're not dancing or moving, just by the way you look, there, there's a difference if, you, if you're looking as someone in love or as, if you're looking as someone who's about to kill somebody yeah. <laughs> or if you're looking as someone who's just been heartbroken. You yes. know, There are different ways. It, it all shows in the eyes, even oh, yeah. from the back of the theater. It shows in the eyes. It shows in the energy. Right. It shows. It is, it is something that we don't necessarily see with our eyes, but that we feel yes. in our energy. 
Yes, because we, we, we come to the theater, because otherwise we'd watch movies, right? Like we come to live theater to feel the energy coming that's off right. the stage. That's right. And that's what, you know, as I'm thinking about it, that's what makes a difference between a great performance and a mediocre performance. That's right. After a great performance, you come out charged. What is it that you're charged with? You're charged with the energy that the dancers, that's the right. artists gave you. Yeah. Projected. Yeah. And, you and, were moved at a yeah. deep level. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, this is this is great because I think it is going to help a lot of uh, dancers, especially those who are starting out, because they're so focused on the technique, on the turnout, and, or, or, and, and every day that's what they spend the majority of their time working on. Mm -hmm. But all of that is just athleticism without the inner life that you're bringing to life yeah. through dance. Yeah. That makes the difference between a regular dancer and a great dancer. Yes. That and musicality, obviously, and... Um, uh, your ability to to move and breathe with your partner and the people around you, right? So you have to be extremely sensitive to everybody else on stage and the music. You know, the music is also propelling the the, the emotional intensity of the story as well. So that also informs your movement and informs your your emotion as well. So there, there are so many elements. You know, when you go on stage, you're you're not only working with your body, but there are there's spatial elements, emotional elements, other people, the the conductor, the music, and even the audience. You know, you can uh, have this feeling, a sense of what's going on with the audience while you're you're moving and. I, I mean, I remember when I um, was dancing, I was so in my right brain, which is all that feeling sense, and that I could feel when somebody would walk into a room without even knowing, not hearing them. I could feel people with my back, you know? We're, we're, just, we're just these feeling beings. Um, so how do you develop that sensitivity? Because, um, you know, again, for, for a young person studying dance, they, they listen to you talk about this and they go, great, I want that sensitivity. I want to develop this in myself. I want to take my dancing to the next level. Is there any practical advice on how to do that, how to increase that sensitivity? Well, I mean, I was, and still am, um, uh, practice, uh, what's the word? Uh, I practice meditation. And meditation for me was very important because when you go into the alpha brainwave state, which is the bridge between your subconscious and your conscious mind, that's where you have connection to all the juices of your creativity and of, of things that you can't access if you're just sort of in your daily life. So the more uh, you can uh, get into those deeper creative juices, uh, and plus meditation helps with stress levels, anxiety, and all of those things, the more sort of grounded you are in your foundation, and also the more you know yourself. The more you know yourself, the more you can use your instrument to much more a much more expanded experience than you could if you're just sort of um, trying to access your creative experience just by thinking about it. You can't really get there. So in practical terms for younger persons, you know, for, so um, for, somebody who, or for somebody who doesn't have an experience, uh, is not an experienced meditator, mm -hmm. uh, what might a meditation look like for, say, a 13-year-old ballerina? Uh, if she wants to follow your advice and she wants to really, or a 15-year-old, doesn't matter, you know, a young person, how could they meditate? What would be like some practical sample meditation for them? Uh, well, funny you should ask that because I actually created a course uh, for dancers, Great. which I did last summer um, at Orlando Ballet School and at um, the University of North Carolina School of the Arts. And it is really about how to get yourself into those states. And I, within the course, uh, I've got five different meditations. And really, um, without even any sort of um, formal training, just sitting uh, 
and breathing and just connecting to the breath, sitting straight and, and connecting to the breath and really staying present with your breath is one of the best things you can do five minutes a day, literally five minutes a day. And just that connecting with the breath is called mindfulness meditation. So even just um, getting your nervous system calm can also ha help you to access more creative states. So one of the practical things everybody can take away from this conversation is that if nothing else, if, if there's one thing you do, if you just calm down and sit quietly for five minutes a day, that already will help you just train you, I guess, to listen to your body and to your mind and to mm -hmm. your soul. Mm -hmm. And that act of listening already will start having things happen inside of you without even you realizing what it is. That's right. Yes. And also to have, have, be proactive, have goals. Right. If you don't have a goal uh, about what you want to do with your life or with that month or that week, um, then a lot of other people's ideas for you will start to sort of take over and sweep you along with them. But if you stay strong in your goals and on positive goals, even if it's as simple as this week, I'm going to have that aha movement. I'm going to stand taller on my legs. I'm going to have more joy in my dancing. Anything that gets you off the negative and focus on the positive will already uh, calm your nervous system down and, and help you to access more creative states. That intentionality, again, both in character and in life, definitely helps. Uh, let's just, as an example, because I'm, I'm, I'm always drawn to practical examples that help people. So a lot of variations, well, one variation that you did, which was amazing uh, to watch, was Kitri. And that's also a lot of dancers come to YHP with the Kitri variation. So could you just kind of run through how your approach, you know, your acting approach, uh, might help a dancer preparing uh, a Kitri variation? So let's take the third act variation, and that's the one with the fan. The one that everybody does. The one that everybody does, and it's so fun. It's so fun to watch, and it's so fun to do. And um, so this is her wedding. She has figured out how to get her man, who was a little, his eye uh, had a tendency to wander. Mm -hmm. And you get to know that in the first, in the first act. Um, she is quite a rebellious young woman. Her father wanted her to marry a very wealthy man, but to her, he was just, you know, the village idiot. And she was in love with a barber who had no money. Uh, but love prevailed. And throughout the entire uh, three acts, she is, is constantly um, rebelling, and also meets Don Quixote. And Don Quixote is, uh, as we know, and I'm not going to go into great detail about his character, but uh, within the ballet, he's this tall, very elegant man. He chases his dream, uh, who is Dulcinea, and Kitri looks like Dulcinea. And whenever he comes across Kitri, he treats her like a queen. And he's so elegant, and he's from the old world. And somehow that, that, that sort of gives her a deeper sense of confidence. And she keeps saying to ba Basil, her boyfriend, look, you know, look how I, this is how you treat a woman, you mm -hmm. know? And so through Don Quixote, she's teaching Basil how to treat her. Right. And she gives uh, her boyfriend a very, very hard time, and her father, who is constantly trying to chase her to get her to marry uh, what she thinks of as the village idiot, even though he's a wealthy man. So by the time she gets into her third act variation, this is a huge celebration. This is success. This is everything that she's wanted, and her... It's so wonderful that, that this story is Spanish because of all the flamenco uh, Spanish arms and the high, proud chests and the sharp uh, 
expressions and the passion, you know. So all of that is, is uh, on top of the ballet technique. So that also is very helpful for her character. And by the time she gets to the third act, this is the celebration of her womanhood. She has, she was a girl and now she's getting married and she is a woman and she's prevailed against all of it, against everything that anybody wanted her to do, she has prevailed. So it's a celebration of who she is as a woman and also of her love for her man. And so there's, there's a lot of very strong and a little saucy uh, kind of movement. And, um, and this, this celebration uh, of, of who she is. And um, the fan really helps because she can have a lot of sort of sharp movements with that or she can have soft movements with that. And, and she shows the whole of a woman. You know, the woman doesn't, isn't always shy or demure. She can also be very strong at the same time. So uh, she's all of it. She's the big picture. And I think if anybody doing that variation can sort of think about who Kichri is by the time she gets out there in that third act variation, it, they'll be doing themselves a favor. Um, and having a, a more in-depth character. So of all that we've discussed, what would be your best advice? I would say the most important thing is to believe what you're doing. Right. If you don't believe, no matter how much deep detail and work that you do, if you don't personally connect to it, throw it out. Go with what your intuition, what your feeling says, because the, the more connected you are to your own feeling and your own truth, the more the character will actually be revealed to you, open up to you, coming through you, coming through your heart and your soul. That's the most important thing, to not superimpose what others think you should be doing but to actually feel it from the inside out and believe. If you can believe, everybody else comes along with you. Right, so, so, so if, if you're celebrating your womanhood, then you should truly celebrate it and then we'll all be along for the ride. Absolutely, and, and who Kitri is, you know, and all her relationships and all of her future possibilities and all of those things, so. So we ask all of our guests to think about themselves when they were teenagers. And I'm sure you've learned something from a life well lived in the world of dance uh, that you wish you knew as a teenage person. So you now have a chance to travel back in time and address the teenage Susan Jaffe. Mm. <laughs> so this, this camera right here is the teenage Susan Jaffe. So mm -hmm. you have a chance to say to that 17, 15, 13 year old something you wish she'd known. Yeah. What would it be? You wasted so much time being down on yourself. And that was a big waste of your energy. If you had just been able to uh, concentrate on the positive more often, I think you would have been a lot happier and freer when you were younger instead of having to go through so much angst and uh, drama. Because um, as you get older, a lot of that drama sort of leaves you because you realize it's just a big waste of time. So that's what I would tell you if I were looking at you right now at the age of 17. Our guest today was great American ballerina and currently the Dean of Dance at the University of North Carolina School of the Arts, Susan Jaffe. I'm Sergey Gordeev and we'll see you next time on Ask the Expert.